Hey everyone, welcome back to the class. In this video, we will discuss chapter 28, Pregnancy and Human Development. So in our last chapter, we talked about the male and female reproductive system. We talked about how they each make sex cells. So as an introduction to this chapter, we'll talk about what happens when those individual sex cells combine and form a new human. So after a pregnancy, a new human will be born and it will eventually grow and develop and eventually age. And there's some terms you should be familiar with with their definition. Uh, the first one is growth. Like the name implies, it's referring to an increase in size due to uh, mitosis. This is how we go from one cell to two, those two become four, and then eight, and so on. That is growth. Uh, next term is development. This is a continuous process as we go through individual uh, changes within our life, from one life phase to another. And there are two uh, very generic ways to classify our lives. You have the prenatal period and the postnatal period. The prenatal period starts from fertilization and goes up to when we are born. Everything after that is postnatal. So from the minute we're born until the minute that we die. All right, the first part we'll talk about in this chapter is fertilization. In our last chapter, we talked about how when the male ejaculates, there could be anywhere between, between 40 million and 600 million sperm cells. And even though those are really high numbers, you're only going to have just a couple hundred at the most even make it uh, anywhere near the secondary oocyte. That's because so many are lost almost immediately once they enter the vagina. And from there, they have to swim up the uterus and then choose the correct path to find the secondary oocyte. So once that happens, the union of that secondary oocyte and then the sperm cell is fertilization. It's also known as conception. Those terms are interchangeable. And this is the beginning of life. And fertilization will take place in the fallopian tube. Not in the uterus, but in the fallopian tube. All right, so we have the uh, vagina down here. We have uh, the cervix right here. And on this image, the secondary oocyte is being ovulated right here where the cursor is. As this occurs, the secondary oocyte will be swept into the fallopian tube. And it will go this way. Uh, the sperm cells that are ejaculated into the vagina will swim up past the cervix into the uterus. And then they can go either to the right or to the left. Now, if they choose the wrong direction, let's say a sperm cell goes this direction, and it's not that ovary that's ovulating that month, well, then they can't fertilize a secondary oocyte because it's not there to be fertilized. So you may have a large number of sperm cells make it this far, but then turn the wrong way. So for our example, we'll continue with the sperm cell going this way. And right about here is where the secondary oocyte and the sperm cell will meet and fertilization will occur in this enlarged area of the fallopian tube here. Now there has to be several hundred sperm cells present in order for one sperm cell to be able to penetrate a secondary oocyte and fertilize it. That's because the secondary oocyte is protected by tissue that's around it. So in order to fertilize it, you have to break through that protective layer. So that's where the acrosomes from the sperm cells come into play. Those acrosomes have uh, digestive enzymes inside them. So you need several hundred of them, wear it down so one can actually break through it all. Then after a sperm cell fertilizes the secondary oocyte, the oocyte will harden the outermost layers and that will prevent other sperm cells from coming in to try to fertilize it. So once you have that fertilization occur, that secondary oocyte will complete the process of meiosis II, which will produce a, a small polar body and an egg nucleus. So this union of sperm cell from the male and the egg cell from the female is the zygote. So here we have the secondary oocyte here. You can see the protective outer layer here. And then you see all these individual sperm cells trying to get to it to fertilize it. But because of this protective layer, you need several hundred of these to be present so each of them can wear through with their acrosomes that protective layer, which is what you see here. So if these cells here aren't present, then this one can't get through. So the more sperm cells that are there, the more likely it is that one will get through to fertilize these secondary oocytes. That last image obviously was illustration. This is how it actually looks. This is one secondary oocyte and the green structures that are around it are the individual sperm cells trying to get past that outermost protective layer to fertilize it. So this image is this process here. All right, so now we have a zygote being formed. So this will lead to pregnancy. 
This is the presence of a developing offspring uh, within the uterus. And a pregnancy will consist of three trimesters. Each one will be approximately uh, three months long. And the uh, prenatal period typically lasts about 38 weeks of counting from conception and can be divided into various stages. You have the period of cleavage, then you have the embryonic stage, and then you have the fetal stage. All right, the very first part of this process is the uh, period of cleavage. And this is important because the very first divisions of the zygote uh, happen fairly rapidly, but they produce uh, cells that are smaller than the original zygote. So this rapid division that produces progressively smaller cells is called cleavage. And the name of the cells that are produced during this time are called blastomeres. All right, so going back to this image, if you have a zygote that's formed right here where the cursor is, it's going to eventually travel up the fallopian tube to get to the uterus. The entire time it is migrating toward the uterus, cells are going to be dividing. But this uh, space is not that wide. So you can't have cells going from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, to 8, to 16. You can't have that mass of cells get larger. The potential is it's going to get stuck somewhere in the fallopian tube. And that happens, and it continues to divide, it's going to rupture the fallopian tube, which is a life-threatening situation for the woman. So the very first divisions of the zygote, are starting right about here, as it moves its way toward the uterus, the cells that are made have to be smaller than the original. All right, here are some actual images of these cells. So here you have one cell in this frame here. Here you have two. And then here you have, it looks like about eight, it could be more. But each of these three frames, the size of the overall space occupied by the cells isn't much different, whether we have one cell, two cells, or up to eight cells. So for here, you have a lot more cells, but in the same amount of space. So that means the cells that are being made are smaller than the original. So you have to have this process happen for the first few divisions. All right, so we have this mass of cells that will move from the fallopian tube toward the uterus. And this takes about three days time, approximately. And at this point, the structure is going to be a solid ball of cells between 16 to 32 cells in number. And this structure is called a morula. And then this structure, the morula, will continue to divide within the uterus for another three days or so. And it will hollow out and form a hollow structure called a blastocyst. So don't confuse blastomere, blastocyst, morula, gastrula. We'll go over that term in a moment. So these terms do sound somewhat uh, similar. Here on this image, we have a summary of what's going on with the number of cells as they divide up here in this top row. And where they are as they migrate from the fallopian tube toward the uterus. Starting from the zygote all the way up to the late morula stage. The number of cells are much higher in number, but they are smaller. The zygote gets formed right about here in the isthmus of the fallopian tube. As it is traveling down, it's going to be dividing. So we have the moila formed right about here, where it's a solid mass. It's starting to hollow out, and it's when you get a blastocyst. At that point, it will land on the endometrium of the uterus. So like I just mentioned, that blastocyst will superficially implant itself on the endometrium. And within this blastocyst is a very specialized region called the ICM, the inner cell mass. This inner cell mass eventually become the embryo. And the cells that form the outer wall of the blastocyst are called the trophoblast. And their role is to develop into structures that will nourish and to assist the embryo in their development. Right, going back to this image uh, briefly, you can see the blastocyst landing on the endometrium. You see this lighter blue area which is highlighted here. That's what's indicated in this image and this image. So here you have the blastocyst basically just sitting on the endometrium lining, but here they will start to implant itself into the endometrial tissue. And then here is lighter blue uh, mass of tissues. That's the inner cell mass. So clearly these two are illustrations. This is how one actually looks. So you can see this entire structure resting on the endometrium here. It's this inner cell mass. That's what will eventually become the embryo, and then eventually the fetus, and then eventually the baby. And then, the, then the outer wall of cells here is the trophoblast. But the entire structure is called a blastocyst. As that blastocyst will start to slowly sink into the endometrium, 
That process is called implantation. It is implanting itself within the lining of the tissue. Now when this happens, the trophoblast will secrete a very specific hormone called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. And this is the hormone that uh, a pregnancy test is looking for, whether it be in urine or in blood. This hormone is not made in any other situation. It's only made when a fertilized zygote is trying to implant itself into the uterus. So this is the only time that this hormone is made in females. Now there has been some research in the last couple of years that this hormone is made in males as a signal of uh, them having testicular cancer. But that research is ongoing uh, as of this point. And this hormone is critically important for the survival of the, of the embryo. It's there to help maintain that early pregnancy. And it's also there to help with the developing placenta. And the placenta, this is the structure that will anchor the embryo to the uterus. It's also the site where gases are exchanged, waste and nutrients are exchanged between the embryo and the mother's blood. So if HCG is not there or not there in the appropriate levels, then this pregnancy will get lost. All right, for here, you have the endometrium, uh, this entire layer of tissue here. And then here is the blastocyst that has now become fully implanted within the endometrium. And you can see the inner cell mass right there. All right, next, we'll talk about hormonal changes during pregnancy. Now, any woman that has ever been pregnant or has ever had a child can definitely attest to this. But there are some very dramatic hormonal changes that occur uh, during pregnancy. Now, some hormones that have been made for years, maybe even decades, are now turned off. Uh, hormones that are being made now that have never been made in the past. So there are some dramatic changes that go on in a fairly short amount of time. So the secretion of HCG is also important because it's going to basically turn off LH and FSH. And you want that to happen because you want to prevent a normal reproductive cycle. You don't want another ovulation to keep occurring. So once you have a blastocyst implanting within the uterus, the whole goal of the reproductive system should be to nourish that mass and then to encourage it and give it the best environment possible to further its development. Uh, the placenta will secrete large amounts of estrogens and progesterone to uh, maintain that uterine lining to make sure it is uh, stable. Uh, this will also inhibit FSH and LH. Uh, these estrogens and progesterone will inhibit uterine contractions. You don't want the muscles of the uterus to contract and potentially uh, dislodge to that implanted blastocyst. And these hormones will additionally enlarge the reproductive organ. And the hormone placental lactogen is what will stimulate the enlargement of the breast. Now, there's another hormone that will direct the production of milk uh, within the female, but placental lactogen is what makes uh, the breast get larger. All right, here we have a pretty straightforward comparison of HCG and estrogen and progesterone throughout the various months of pregnancy. So you can see very clearly the very large spike of HCG, and that is absolutely necessary to maintain uh, a developing blastocyst. So once you have the development on the right track, then you can turn down HCG, at that point, uh, estrogens and progesterone will take over. They will be there to maintain the development of the developing embryo and fetus. All right, we talked about the first part, the period of cleavage. Now we'll talk about the next phase of a pregnancy. That is the embryonic stage. Now this stage will extend from the beginning of the second week through the end of the eighth week. So basically, the start of week number two to the end of the second month. So in this stage, you have the placenta being formed, you have the main internal organs being developed, and you have major external body features will start to appear. Now there are other features that are developing at this point that you should be familiar with. The first one is called the chorion. The chorion is a second layer of cells that will align the trophoblast. And they are there to not only protect the developing embryo, but to nourish the developing embryo. It is also there to help with the development of the placenta. So as the placenta is forming, there's another structure that gets developed, a second membrane that will uh, develop around the embryo, and that's called the amnion. Now the cells of the amnion will produce a very a particular fluid called amnionic fluid. And this is what will allow the developing embryo to grow without being pressed by the tissues around it. So when a woman's water breaks when she's going to labor, that's the fluid that is coming out. It's not water, it's amnionic fluid. By the end of the second week of development, the embryo has now formed three very distinct layers of development called germ layers. This is where all of our body systems will originate from. 
And those germ layers are the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So be familiar with what is and what is not an example of a germ layer. And at this point, at the end of the second week, the embryo is now called a gastrula. So don't confuse gastrula with morula or blastocyst or trophoblast or blastomeres. These terms are similar, but they have very specific meanings. On this image, we have the easy to reference a table of the various stages of early prenatal development, going from zygote all the way down to the gastrula at the end of the second week. And it summarizes different stages and different time periods that this will reference and the principal events that occur in each stage. So this is basically a summary of the last several slides, but in one uh, convenient table. Now some other structures that will develop at this time. The first one is called a yolk sac. This is what will form uh, blood cells in early development. And these will eventually become the cells that will turn into the sex cells. Egg cells for females and uh, sperm cells for males. Uh, next structure is called the allantois or allantois. Either pronunciation is fine. And this is the structure that will give rise to the umbilical vessels. And in early development, this is a structure that will serve as the respiratory organ for the developing embryo, because at this point, the lungs are nowhere near developed. But this structure will serve that role for the embryo. And at this point, you also have the umbilical cord that's being developed. And this is the structure that will anchor the developing embryo to the placenta. And this is why we all have a, a belly button. That's where the umbilical cord attached to us when we were a developing embryo. Here we have an illustration of a developing embryo here. This light blue color, this Carolina blue color, would be the amniotic fluid. Then the amnion would be the outermost region of that. So it's basically an embryo within a plastic bag filled with fluid. Or right here you have the yolk sac here, the allantois here. This light mint green color is the, the developing placenta, the chorions, the outermost area here. And then this section over here would be the endometrium. So going a little bit further on in development, you have uh, that same embryo, of course a little bit larger, looks a little bit different. We'll talk about some of those features here in a second. You can see the various regions a little bit more clearly. Myometrium, of course the muscle. Uh, endometrium here, the chorion here, the, the early part of the placenta. So all of these structures will get further internal into the endometrium to help anchor uh, the developing embryo to the uterus. All right, the next series of images uh, have illustrations as showing the progression of development. All right, the image for A here is around day 35, give or take a day. And some features are already pretty visible. Uh, you have the lens of the eye here. You have the maxilla and the mandible of the jaw. The maxilla is the upper jaw, mandible is your lower jaw. What will eventually become the arms, you know, the forelimbs are here. The fingers have not separated at this point yet. Same thing with the hind limbs. The tail is still pretty prominent. Yes, we all have a tail at this point still. So going ahead two more days, you have the uh, developing ear, you can see. Uh, the eye is a little bit more developed here. The elbow is becoming more recognizable. Uh, adding a few more days to that, so around day 40, 41, uh, the eye is becoming more pigmented at this point. The external ear features more more distinguishable. The external acoustic meatus, uh, the feature that most students call the ear hole. Uh, in the forelimb, you can see the actual digits starting to become a little bit more separated. Uh, the heart prominence is pretty pretty clear to see. Uh, the tail has become much shorter than it was even just a few days earlier to this. Adding five days or so, the fingers are becoming much more separated. The toes are becoming a little bit more separated. The tail is shortened even more. All right, here we have illustration on the left and then the actual image of the embryo on the right. This is around day 49 or 50 of development. Ear, pretty obvious. Uh, the eyelid is starting to be developed here. Uh, the fingers are more webbed. They haven't fully separated, but they, they're on their way to becoming fully separated. The toes are not as separated yet. The tail is basically gone, if not completely gone at this point. And looking at the real one, you can easily see the eye, the heart prominence, pretty visible. You can see the webbing in between the fingers. You can see the ear, the external ear feature here. All right, day 52 approximately. The fingers have now become fully separated, so they are going to resemble what we have as, as adults. Uh, the toes are almost fully uh, separated. There's still more webbing there. So moving forward a few more days, so now we're at day 56. So now at this point, the hands and feet, the digits have totally uh, separated, so they are uh, individual digits. And here, this is the, uh, the last part of the embryonic stage. So this is the end of the second month of development. So you can clearly see the pigmented eye here, 
many of the blood vessels of the brain. You see the individual digits of the on the feet and in the hands. You can clearly see the umbilical cord here, the space that is included within the amniotic cavity. And of course that will change very, very shortly after this point in time. But this is how we all look at the end of the second month of development. This is a, a typical image of a of an embryo. Okay, the final stage uh, in this overall process is the fetal stage. Uh, the fetal stage begins at the end of the eighth week and continues on throughout the rest of uh, the prenatal development. So people tend to use the term embryo and fetus as if they're interchangeable terms, and they are not interchangeable. They indicate very specific uh, levels of development. The embryo is from the beginning of week number two to the end of month number two. The fetus is everything beyond that. So the beginning of the third month on till the baby comes to term. So in the stage, we're going to have rapid growth and rapid development of the fetus. Body proportions will change considerably, considering where we're starting from. At the beginning of the stage, the head is disproportionately larger compared to the limbs of the fetus. So on this image, it will show a progression of male on top and a female on bottom. And you can see here, when we're talking about the end part of the embryonic stage, how large the head is compared to the, the size of its limbs. But then as we get older, things start to become more evened out, you know, especially as we are an adult. But same thing here with the female. And going back to this image, this is the end of the embryonic stage. This is around week number eight of our development. You can tell even on here how large the head is compared to the size of the limbs. So at the end of uh, the twelfth week, this is when the fetus is distinguishable as either male or female. And those are the only two possibilities. You're either going to be male or female and nothing else. Now regardless if the fetus is male or female, all fetuses start off as female. But due to the presence of the Y chromosome, which will direct the production of testosterone, those fetuses will eventually become male. So it doesn't matter who you are, we all started off as a, a female embryo and a female fetus. And it's because of this that all of our external reproductive organs will correspond to the opposite sex. So for example, what remains the clitoris in females will become the penis in males. What remains the labia in females eventually will become uh, the scrotum in males. All right, here on uh, images A and B, we have uh, the developing uh, genitals of the fetus. And you have the legend here of the various tissues that we'll focus on. I will focus on the path on the right first because this is a female so once you get to this point this structure that's on top would be the developing uh, clitoris then you can see how the how the folds of this of this tissue will eventually become uh, the opening to the vagina and to the urethra here and then the tissue around it all would be the the labia majora but in this fetus if the uh, y chromosome is there directing uh, testosterone production and that fetus will become male. So instead of the uh, developing clitoris, that will become uh, the glans penis, or the head of the penis. The tissue that would remain the labia for females will eventually wrap around uh, the testes and will uh, form the scrotum in males, which is what you see here and here. You can also see how the tissue that would normally be the uh, labia in females actually forms uh, the foreskin or their prepuce uh, for the males also. So this is a good side-by-side -side comparison between male and female as we develop as a fetus. And the different tissue types are color coordinated. So you can tell what's happening with each tissue type in each sex. All right, continuing on with the uh, fetal stage, uh, by the end of uh, week number 16 or the end of the fourth month, the fetus will now have uh, hair and nails and then the skeleton will continue to ossify. Uh, by the end of week number 20, the muscles will get much stronger. And the body is covered with a very fine, uh, delicate hair called lanugo. By the end of the uh, six-month or 24-week period, 
the fetus has gained a large amount of weight and in addition the eyebrows and the eyelashes are now are visible by week 28 or the seventh month fat will be deposited within the subcutaneous tissue uh, the eyelids will reopen and the last eight weeks of this stage you will have the uh, testes of the male uh, will descend organs will become a lot more specialized and neurons within the brain will become a lot more networked with each other and the last two body systems that are uh, developed within the fetus are the digestive and the respiratory systems this is why if a baby is born prematurely they almost always have a problem with their lungs that's why they're put in an incubator right away because they have not had time to uh, fully develop yet All right, on this table we have a summary of what we just had on the last several slides with the some highlights of the various stages the time period that focusing on and the major events of those stages so when it comes to information like this uh, when it comes to the test I would not ask you know on which of these happens on the 24th or by the 24th week or by the 20th week if this were a class on obstetrics then certainly I would ask something like that but this is to show you how things progress as we develop another good thing about this table uh, it includes the average size of the of the structure at this point so for example in the fetal stage the very first part of that so week number nine uh, through week number 12 the size is about four inches or 10 centimeters and it would weigh about one ounce which is roughly 28 grams so to go from there to the very end of this process the size could be about 21 inches and weigh anywhere between six to ten pounds now on this slide are just some stats i wanted to include is to show you how unlikely it is for a pregnancy to actually happen and then go to full term so out of every 100 oocytes that are exposed to sperm of those 100 only 84 are going to be fertilized and of those 84 only 69 will ever become fully implanted within the uterus of those 69 only 42 will survive one week or longer only 37 will survive six weeks or longer so of that original uh, 69 that we're talking about only 31 will be born alive so there are countless things that can go wrong between the male reproductive system not working or the female reproductive system not working properly but even if you have fertilization there's still so many things that can go wrong and do go wrong all the time so just because you have fertilization that's not going to guarantee unfortunately a baby being carried to full term I've seen some research that says uh, women who are sexually active and who don't use protection 50% of them get pregnant and never know it because that pregnancy gets lost within their next uh, reproductive cycle because it never implanted fully in the endometrium or the hormone levels were not adequate enough so they were pregnant and had no clue and will probably never know that they were pregnant all right, the next major topic we'll talk about in this chapter is fetal blood circulation. Now, because of the environment that the fetus is in, the circulation system has to be different for a fetus compared to an adult. Now, for example, uh, the hemoglobin within a fetus has a much higher oxygen carrying capacity compared to an adult. Think of all the growth that is going on in such a short amount of time. That's going to require a lot of energy a lot of oxygen has to be there to fuel the, those cells that are dividing and growing and not only is the pathway for blood different when it comes to fetuses but there are some structures that are only found within the fetus that are not found within a, a newborn or an adult because think of what we're talking about we're talking about a developing fetus which is basically uh, residing in a bag filled with water you know, the amniotic fluid so certain things have to be done differently in order for it to work. All right, blood will go from the mother to the fetus through the placenta and then the umbilical vein and arteries. Now oxygenated blood is carried by the umbilical vein towards the fetal heart and there's only one uh, of those structures. The two umbilical arteries will carry carbon dioxide and other waste from the fetus to the mother. So make sure that you are able to match what is carrying what. Of all the blood that goes to uh, the fetus, about half of that oxygenated blood 
from the umbilical vein will continue on to the liver. The other half of that blood will travel through a vessel called the ductus venosus, and it will go right from there to the inferior vena cava and then to the right atrium. So half of the blood goes to the liver, the other half goes directly to the heart in the fetus. So at this point, blood can take one of two different paths. Both of these paths almost completely bypass the lungs because they are not functional yet. There'll be some blood that goes to the lungs so it can be nourished and have oxygen delivered and so it can grow, but a great majority of the blood will completely bypass the lungs at this point. All right, in one of these pathways, blood will travel from the right atrium directly to the left atrium. And this is done uh, through a, a opening called the foramen ovale. Remember the term uh, foramen means a hole or an opening, and ovale means oval. So it literally is an oval-shaped opening in between the two atria. So it won't go from the right atrium to the right ventricle to the lungs and come back to the left side of the heart like you would see in an adult. We're going right from right atrium directly to the left atrium. In the second pathway, most of the blood in the pulmonary trunk will bypass the lungs by entering a structure called the ductus arteriosus. This will connect it directly to the aorta. So don't confuse ductus arteriosus with ductus venosus. Two different parts of the body, two different functions. Here we have the uh, ductus venosus right there. So half the blood will go to the liver. The other half will pass through that structure and go on to the right atrium of the heart. And to better uh, visualize the ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale, I'll go ahead to uh, this image. So in this image, the foramen ovale is labeled as the oval uh, foramen. Uh, it's the same thing. So this is where blood will pass right from the right atrium here directly to the left atrium over here. And from there, it will be uh, pumped out uh, like normal. The ductus arteriosus, which is right here, that will direct most of the blood that's coming through the pulmonary trunk to bypass the lungs almost completely and go directly to the aorta. And what should happen after the baby is born, within the first few hours of being born, the foramen ovale will, be, will become closed and sealed off, so that should not be an issue. And the ductus arteriosus will become uh, closed off also. And that's due to the differences of pressure in the atmosphere. It is not uncommon for those to remain open when they shouldn't be, even after the baby is born. But those can be fixed with multiple kinds of surgeries. But the foramen ovale should go away within a couple hours after being born. Same thing with the ductus arteriosus and the ductus venosus. All of those structures are only found in a fetus as it develops. All right, here is another table that we've seen uh, this chapter. It lists the adaptation when it comes to the fetal blood circulation, and then what its main function is. This is a good way to summarize uh, the differences between the umbilical vessels, ductus venosus, ductus arteriosus, and so on. So this would be a good a table to reference if you'd like to make flashcards. On this slide is a comparison between uh, circulation within the fetus and circulation within an adult, and how they are different. So you should be familiar with how they are different. Uh, for adults, arteries in general, will carry oxygenated blood away from the heart, and the veins will carry non-oxygenated blood. And of course, you can see the, the asterisks I have here. That's not including the pulmonary vessels. The pulmonary vessels, that's going to be backwards. But in general, arteries will carry blood with oxygen. Veins will carry blood without oxygen. And the site of the exchange of gases will occur within the lungs for adults. In a fetus, arteries will carry non-oxygenated blood away from the fetal heart, the umbilical vein will carry oxygenated blood back to the heart, and the exchange of gases in the fetus is in the placenta, not in the lungs, because the lungs aren't formed yet. All right, so now we have the fetus that's fully formed and ready to come out. So this will lead up to the birth process, and this process is technically known as parturition. As the placenta ages, it becomes less and less effective, and the levels of progesterone will start to get lower and lower. This decline of progesterone will trigger uh, some hormones to cause the uterine muscles to contract. As this is happening, the cervix will start to efface or start to thin out and will soon become open. So the, the stretching of the uterine muscles will cause the posterior pituitary gland to release oxytocin, which will stimulate even stronger uterine contractions. 
if you've ever gone through childbirth, if you had your labor induced, you're most likely given tocin, which is a synthetic form of oxytocin. So these uh, stronger uterine contractions will cause the fetus to move further down toward the cervix. And it starts a, a never-ending cycle that goes on for many, many hours until the baby uh, is born. So here's what's going on. You have, you have the cervix being stretched, which will cause uh, certain stretch receptors to be stimulated, which causes the release of oxytocin, which will cause more, even stronger uterine contractions, which will cause the fetus to be moved further down the birth canal which means the, the head of the fetus will be closer to the cervix, which means it gets stretched even more. And this cycle goes on and on and on, hour after hour after hour, until the baby is born. Because at that point, there is no stimulus on the cervix to stretch it. So there's no reason for the uterus to continue to contract. So this is what's going on during the uh, birthing process. So if all that you know about a woman in labor and a woman giving birth is what you've seen on television or in movies. You probably just think that once the baby comes out, you wrap it in a clean blanket or a clean towel, you cut the umbilical cord, and that's all. Well, that's not the case at all. In addition to the fetus being delivered, the placenta has to be expelled also. So during the birth process, the placenta will separate from the uterine wall and will travel through the birth canal right behind the baby. So you cannot have the placenta remaining within the uterus. If it can't come out naturally, then doctors have to go in and manually retrieve it. And the expelled placenta is also known as the afterbirth. So it's not just a baby that's being expelled from the uterus. There's a lot more things that are coming out in addition to baby. All right, here we have a very generic representation of the process. Of course, you have a baby getting ready to be delivered here. You see the cervix about to open here. At this point, the amniotic sac is ruptured, so the, the woman's water has broken. So, of course, you see the baby on the way out here. And after the baby is already out, it's still attached to the umbilical cord to the placenta here. So the placenta has come detached from the uterine wall. When that comes out of the birth canal, that's when it's classified as the afterbirth. All right, next we'll talk about milk production and accretion. Around the fifth week of pregnancy, uh, the anterior pituitary gland will increase the production of the hormone prolactin. And this is done so to prepare for the milk production for the newborn. So you have placental lactogen that will cause uh, structures to get larger, like the breast, but prolactin is what will actually trigger the, the production of milk itself. And this first milk that is produced is very watery, very thin, very, very high in antibodies, very high in protein, but very low in carbohydrates, very low in fats. And this first milk is called colostrum. But it is important because it has such a high amount of uh, antibodies. And then the normal breast milk, the mature milk, will come in a few days after this. And that, that normal breast milk will be very high in fat, very high in carbohydrates, and much lower in protein, much lower in antibodies. All right, here we have uh, histological slides of breast tissue. This is at the early part of pregnancy. This is at the end of pregnancy. A very clear difference in size due to placental lactogen physically increasing the size and then the production of milk. All right, so now the baby has been born. Uh, we are entering the postnatal period. So this starts from when the baby is born to when they die. And this very long time frame is divided into several smaller phases. The first one is the neonatal period. So this is a newborn baby. So this is from when the baby is born to the end of the first month. Infancy is the end of the first month to the end of the first year. Childhood is from the end of the first year to puberty. Adolescence is from puberty to adulthood. And of course, when puberty starts will vary depending on each individual person. Adulthood is from adolescence to old age. And the very last stage of our lives is called senescence. This is from old age to when we die. So you should be familiar with what these terms reference and then the correct order. Okay, that brings us to the end of this of this chapter and also to the end of our course for bio 169 for the spring 2020 semester like always if you have questions on the content feel free to send me a text or, or email me come by to my online office hours on monday and wednesday mornings 9 30 to 11 and if i can help you in future classes please feel free to reach out to me thank you for watching